Okay, welcome everybody to episode 51 of the Volatility Barometer. So, did have some internet issues today, unfortunately, um, cut out twice on me. Internet's usually really good here, but it did cut out twice. So, fingers crossed, everything will be fine. Just want to highlight a few of the recent videos before we get started. So, I did one talking about short-term versus long-term capital gains. I think all investors will be interested in this one. Ran some numbers on the actual difference between them. Of course, most people will have their money in their IRA or their tax-sheltered accounts and everybody's gonna be tax efficient, but there will be people who maybe make more money and can save more money. They'll have money outside of their IRAs. I ran the numbers on what the difference is, and um, spoiler alert, it's really much smaller than people think, but you can check out that video on the YouTube channel. And then I did an article recently, also highlighting the major differences between our three tactical strategies, if you're interested in that. That is an article called uh, Three strategies with three different volatility focus, that's on the website as well. So today we are basically just going to answer questions from the community forum. So let's get started and fingers crossed this internet doesn't fail me because I've got several things going on. I'm also live streaming to the other clips channel. So uh, anyway, let's see, I, I think it's gonna be okay, but let's get started. Okay, so you can see I just ran a little thing there and in the comment section, I think I attached, hopefully that you could see that there, you can claim your free trial to VTS. No obligation, of course, you can cancel the day before. If you happen to forget to cancel, don't worry, just email me and I'll cancel and refund and do all that. But if you wanna see what we actually do here, you can claim your free trial. So let's get started. So what we do every week is if you go to my main YouTube channel, you can see there's a community tab here. We've got videos, live, playlist. If you click community, every Monday I'm gonna post the submissions and you can go in here and you can ask your questions basically. So all of these will be answered. And then for some of the best ones, usually I will chop them up and do some editing and I might throw those on the clips channel as well. So if you do wanna get a full flushed out answer to something, you can go ahead and answer, or ask me here and hopefully we will get to it during the live stream. Okay, so let's get started. Just grab some coffee. All right, Arthur asks, and we'll just go down the list. If this is going too long, I might stop sort of halfway through and then answer a few from the live chat and then jump back here. But let's see how it goes. I'll try to be quicker than I usually am. So people know that I can ramble a little bit. Let's see if we can fire some of these off quickly. Okay, so thanks for the great Iron Condors course where you discuss strike selection and exits. Can you elaborate on entry strategy? You mentioned something about waiting for a reversal. So yes, the first thing that I can do is I can highlight the Iron Condor course. So thank you for that question. We basically have a course that I put together, a bunch of videos, there's another page here, but basically just going over Iron Condors and everybody who signs up for VTS gets access to this. So again, you can claim your free trial and you can see it. You don't actually have to continue paying, but you can watch all the videos in the next two weeks and then leave if you want. Um, I probably shouldn't say that, but yeah, go ahead, claim the free trial if you wanna see this. But yes, all of these videos, we're talking about all the subjects with iron condors. So allocation size, how to execute trades correctly, stop losses, all kinds of stuff. Calendar options is the next page. But what you're looking for is this one. There's also a spreadsheet, by the way, but you're talking about this video here called the Rules of Engagement, which essentially, there should be a page here somewhere. Oh, it was on there. So this page here is essentially some basic rules of engagement. Let's see if I can blow this up. Hopefully you can still see this. If you cover today, have their own. There we go. If I click, you should be able to see it. So what this is, this isn't an exhaustive list, of course, but the general way that we trade iron condors is all of these things. So these are the rules that we follow. No e or only highly liquid ETFs. We don't trade individual stocks. They are a little bit too volatile. They have corporate earnings. They've got 
corporate announcements. There can be surprises. So we, tick, we stick to the ETFs. Number two, iron condors during mid to high volatility because, of course, they're vague and negative trades. And calendars we trade when volatility is very low because they're also delta neutral, but they tend to behave vega positive. So we just divide the market. Maybe 75% of the time we're doing condors, 25% calendars. This one here is what you're talking about. We don't open trades right near strong trend points. I'll circle back to that in a second, but let me just finish this off for everybody else. 45 to 75 days to expiration, about 15 delta trades, 3% allocation. We layer as many as three trades at once. We could do 50% stop loss, 50% stop gain to make sure that we're maximizing our capital efficiency. Um, we can take additional layers, but only if the underlying moves by a certain amount. You don't want to just double up the same trade. If the price hasn't moved, then why bother? But if it moves significantly, we can get another layer. And then finally, iron condors should be traded independently. Ba basically, it says, I don't really do anything in this portfolio that is affected by the other things in the other strategies. So let me make sure I'm screen sharing here. That is a mistake that I commonly make. So let me give you an example. What you're asking, again, just to highlight your question here, you're wondering about why I mentioned that I wait for a reversal. So what you're getting at here, and I can give you an actual example. What I mean is when you're trading an iron condor, it will look something like this. We've got a live trade on now. We've actually got a couple. So you got, your standard iron condor looks like this. You want the price to stay somewhere in this middle range. It doesn't have to pin to the center. It can move around, but you don't want it to deviate too far in either direction. So when you're entering trades, you don't want to enter something on a strong trend, either up or down. So I can use both of these examples. But if this is trending really strongly upwards, you wouldn't want to open a new trade here because if the market does reverse, sometimes those reversals are pretty strong the first couple of days. Like you can see, there's a pretty big crash right there. So what you would do if you noticed that things were progressing upwards, right? Say, you know, it's pretty obvious to see that this is an uptrend, right? What you would want to do is wait for a couple of days of weakness so that it gets back closer to a short-term, medium-term average, right? You don't want to open it here. You'd wait for this one, and this actually would have been probably a good day. The same thing would apply on the downside. If something is crashing, you don't want to follow it like right there. This is a trend that's pretty strong. Just wait for a day or two of weakness, or in this case, strength, and go ahead and open one there. It's a little bit closer to the average. Again, here, this would not have been a good day. And of course, looking forward, you never know if it's going to continue or not. The point is, it's not overly difficult to identify a strong trend. And then all you do is you just wait for maybe one day. You could have done it here. You could have done it here. Another one here. No problem. As long as you kind of pad your trade a little bit by those first couple of days, essentially, is what we're getting at. So our recent example, we opened a trade yesterday. Well, why would I do that? I'll show you exactly why I did that. This, again, is a strong trend. I would not have opened one here. I would have waited for this day or this day. And again, here, this is very recent action. It's not that difficult to see that in the last, say, eight or nine days before we've seen the weakness, I don't want to open a trade here. So I was waiting. Every day, I'm just waiting. Every day you log into your VTS email, no new trade, no new trade. I could have done one here, but the problem is when you combine that also with the fact that the next cycle had at that time 75 days, it was a little bit long. So I kind of wanted to wait a day or two. And so I opened one yesterday right here. And that is a little bit closer to the average. So if it does get that whipsaw, it's going to be insulated a little bit, right? You might get two or three extra percent to work with. And again, with trading, none of these are going to be Wait, what's going on here? Is my software working? Sorry, I lost one of my windows. Just let me get this show scenes window. There it is. Sorry, little technical difficulty. Um, with, with trading, no matter what you're doing, option trading, tactical investing, none of these things are really mind-blowing. They're not going to change your results radically. It's really just about building small edges over time and waiting for those little reversals. It just means that a higher percentage of your trades, you'll probably be able to hang in them for an extra couple of days. If you are in the habit of buying or selling iron condors or buying calendars eight days into a really strong trend, 
you can get hit with one of those reversal days. And sometimes those are the strongest days. If it's going up, you can get a down two or three day. And that's already gonna push you a little bit uncomfortable to the edges. If it's going down really strongly, as you know, one good announcement from the Fed or the government, it can bounce 3% the next day. You're gonna get into a trade and you could get stopped out in two days. So just to avoid that, we do actually kind of wait for those little opportunities here and there. You don't have to wait for a full reversal, but like I said, just kind of up here, get in a trade somewhere around there. It's actually not that hard to identify. Good question though. Okay, number two. I usually scan, like I really appreciate all the nice comments, but I try to scan and not read it because I'm reading it about myself and it's embarrassing to say like my brilliant educational work. Thank you very much for the compliments. Have you ever thought of settling? House, children, being a nomad is no fun when getting older. So this is an interesting question. He's referring to the fact that I do move around a lot. I am a digital nomad and I like living in different countries. So the great thing about being a nomad, of course, is the whole concept of it is doing what suits your lifestyle best. That's how people end up in this lifestyle to begin with. I got here because I'm analyzing the, you know, the environment and saying, I would like these traits. It's like going to a restaurant. You don't have to get the same thing. You can choose off the menu what suits you best, right? You choose based on your own palate. So being a nomad means that I am actually accepting the fact that just because I was born somewhere doesn't mean I have to always live there. And if that's the case, I can just build my life the way that I want. So your question, what happens if I feel like it's no longer fun? Well, I just stop doing it. There's nothing saying that I have to keep going. Like say I did have kids that were at the same school and there's just it's not feasible to be moving around. Well, then I wouldn't, just as simple as that. But I know a lot of people can make it work with families and wives and kids and all those things. It really, who says that you have to have a traditional life where you have one home and you grow up there and you stay there for 30 years? Who says? I'm also a person who doesn't think that everybody has to grow up and go to university. Everybody has to grow up and do X, Y, Z thing that society says. So yeah, I would say that, look, I'll do it for as long as I want. I've been doing it for 25 years. And if it ever did get to the point where I thought, yeah, this has kind of run its course and I'm done for now, then I would just be done and that would be it. So no big deal. Um, I like the lifestyle, but if it ends, it ends. I have no long-term plans. I just analyze what I do. And, and like I said, this is one of the things, it's, it's more of a mindset thing. People really do have this idea that if you're born somewhere, you just stick there. But actually you can just go to countries that suit you better. I know people who perhaps move to countries simply because of taxes, no other reason. They just, they're tired of paying the high taxes. That's why they're a nomad. I know people who just simply like to travel and they get bored in the same place. That's why they're a nomad. Some people maybe want to meet a woman and you're not having so much luck in the Western countries, you know, with the maybe less traditional values and all those things, the dating apps and how young men are treated these days, you know, the extremely high unrealistic expectations. Maybe you would find better luck overseas in, you know, Eastern Europe, maybe in other countries, more traditional places, Asia, for example. Um, I know people who move simply because of weather. They just, maybe you're a beach person and where you were born, you're born in Albuquerque, New Mexico or wherever it is and there's just no beaches there. So you, uh, you, you become a digital nomad and you move to one of the Caribbean islands or you move here to Dubai. There's miles of beaches everywhere. All kinds of different reasons, but uh, just do what suits you best. Don't conform just simply because you happen to be birth lottery, you were born somewhere. Okay, long one here. In general, how would you advise someone to evaluate whether a course is worth buying without obviously being able to see the contents before you buy? Yes, of course, that is the catch, isn't it? Uh, everybody's marketing is pretty decent, but how do you know without actually buying it? What kind of red flags do you look out for? How would you estimate how much value it will actually bring? Is there a type of content you feel is more useful than others? Trade ideas, tools, strategies, understanding specific options, concepts. So I, I read your question just a couple hours ago. So I put together a list, hopefully you can see it 
here, just going over some basic red flags. Again, this is not a totally exhaustive list. It's a pretty good topic. Maybe I'll write this down later and make a full video on it. But if you wanted some basic red flags, really to get you most of the way there, I would say the first one you're looking at, and maybe above all else, this is the one to look out for, is you want to find people, you want to avoid people, these are red flags, so a red flag, you want to avoid people that have little, if any, public work before the course launched. Now, what I mean by this, unfortunately, a lot of the people that sell courses doesn't specifically have to be investing. It can be real estate flipping. It can be Amazon, Amazon drop shipping. Whatever the course itself is, some very high percentage. Let me just pluck something out of thin air. 95% of all the courses out there in all the areas fall into the same category. It is a person who isn't good at the thing that the course is talking about. What they're actually good at is modern, modern day social media. They're good at marketing, they're good at making videos, they're very good at getting attention, very good at making thumbnails that are catchy and make people click on them. They're good at setting up funnels for email systems. That's what they're good at. And then they go out and they find the thing that the course is gonna be based on, but they just fill that in afterwards. So it's essentially business first, they know that they wanna be an entrepreneur, they want an online business, they're very good at that, they grew up in the social media age and all of this stuff is second nature, and then they go out and figure out what they're going to sell. And for that, you can probably just watch a bunch of YouTube videos and fake it, basically. So if it's real estate flipping, you, you know you're very good at getting attention, you know that you can build a very successful YouTube channel or a Twitter following, then you just figure out what business you're gonna do. So you really wanna be careful of this. And one thing that you can really you know, avoid is it should be very obvious that the vast majority of their work, which extends back a long period of time, is not connected to the course. That's just not how people with expertise function. They don't emerge into the public eye with business on day one. Typically, if you're, list if you're following somebody who's serious, the, bus the, the work comes first. The business comes many years after that. So I'll use myself as an example. I've been investing for 17 years. I didn't start making YouTube videos until five years ago. So I had 12 years experience, had made all my mistakes, had run the course. Most of it didn't even plan to do anything publicly. I was just sharing my work. And then the business comes later. You do not want to follow people who fall into this category of business first, because a lot of these I call them kids, but maybe they're in their 20s and 30s at this point because millennials are getting older too. But a lot of them are exceptionally good at selling stuff online. They're really not experts in what they're selling. They're, they're experts in the actual process of entrepreneurship. Uh, far better than me. I mean, my YouTube channel, I feel like my content's really good, but I just don't know how to do the modern age attention grabbing. I'm just not very good at that. So I don't get the views and the clicks and all that stuff, but you know, I do have the 17 years experience. So you want to avoid people where you can't very obviously see that maybe they have a website with 300 articles on it. They've got a YouTube channel dating back eight years and 90% of their videos either just briefly mention the course or not at all. You don't want to follow somebody who it's pretty obvious that the course came first and the business came second. That's really not, not very good. Uh, the second thing, of course, this is a dead giveaway, outlandish performance expectations. As we know, and as anybody watching should know, investing is very difficult. And when you're dealing with serious people, when you're dealing with somebody who actually has been in the game for five or 10 years, they're going to know that while it is possible to have one good year, two good years that really shock you with performance numbers, any serious investor knows that that is short-lived, that not all strategies perform well in all environments, and your rate of return, if you're talking portfolio-wide, it does sort of narrow down quite quickly. The, the more years you do it, the more that fades away. So one of the biggest dead giveaways is if somebody truly doesn't understand what a good rate of return is. If you ask the person who's selling the course, what do you think is a decent rate of return? If they say anything more than about, you know, like I said, 25%-ish, Anything more than that, they're not serious. They're either, they're either lying or they haven't been doing it long enough to have learned that lesson. They don't know that investing is a lot harder than they think it is. So don't ever follow anybody who doesn't seem to have a very good grasp of actual performance numbers. That's a dead giveaway. 
Number three, they don't show any performance, right? Now, in this case, I'm not expecting anybody online to audit their trading account and send you some type of KPMG audit or, you know, every year they get it stamped by Deloitte. That We're not expecting that. And to, to be honest, most people can't do that anyway. Like for me, I can't audit my trading account because I test all my strategies in the same account. There's no auditor that would sit there and say, I'm going to tell him, no, this trade, that one counts. This one doesn't count. That one counts. This one doesn't. Nobody's going to sign their name to that. So we're not expecting an audit, but you should be able to see something, some statistics, charts that show their performance, a model portfolio, something, right? Again, a serious investor knows that performance is going to be part of the equation and you definitely want to see something. And then the last thing, and this is very common, I call it selling trade ideas, but essentially selling outlines or ideas. What they're doing here, and sometimes they even spell it out exactly. They'll say, if you subscribe to my service, you will get three trade ideas per day. This is a very nebulous, meaningless thing, right? When you pay money for something, you better be getting something extremely concrete for your money. Otherwise, there is a myriad of free videos and articles out there. There's thousands. You could keep yourself busy forever getting ideas and structure. You're not paying for somebody to tell you how to build an iron condor strategy. You're, you're paying somebody to tell you when to use it, how to allocate it correctly, entries and exits, how to, most importantly, how to put it inside a diversified portfolio, how to manage the risk. Anybody in any free YouTube video can teach you the basic ideas. So what you'll often see is people are really selling these ideas. And one of the giveaways, of course, if it's a subscription-based service, is they will not give you a free trial and there will be some type of upfront fee. They're essentially counting on the fact that you're gonna be disappointed. You're, you're gonna get in there and go, wow, this is, this is just some guy giving out ideas. Anybody can do that. I mean, give me an hour, I'll give you 100 trade ideas. It doesn't mean that that's how you build a portfolio. If we're just talking ideas, I mean, how long have you got? I'll just, I'll just spitball ideas all day long. But when you pay money, of course, you want concrete things. You want to buy a course that gives you a spreadsheet. You know, I've even, I can even show you like a spreadsheet. For example, VTS options, this is not finished yet, but they're going to get data. And for this strategy, for example, they'll get a spreadsheet with quite literally exactly how to build the strategy start to finish. And then literally the exact daily trade signals spelled out in plain English. This is what you do based on the entire strategy, right? If, if it's just trade ideas like, oh, you know, maybe we could short UVXY, the VIX futures are in contango. Here's another idea, an iron condor today on the SPY because the volatility has ridden. That's a pretty good idea. I could email you a hundred of those a day. It doesn't mean you should pay me any money for that. So I would say that that's a pretty good start. If somebody can qualify and sort of jump through all four of these hoops, They've got a long history of a, of a track record or of, of public work. They've got a very large body of work, 90% of it being free. That's a good start. They don't give a performance expectations beyond a reasonable level. That shows that they actually understand investing and how difficult it is. They're not going to be toying with your money because they've already run those experiments with their own money and they know it's difficult. Number three, of course, they need to show you some type of expectation in a very easy to read chart, very clear statistics. This is the, the rate of return. These are the drawdowns. This is the sharp ratio. These are not difficult to calculate. And then lastly, of course, only pay for actual concrete ideas and really flushed out strategies. You don't waste your money on anybody that's doing ideas because those ideas lead to other ideas, lead to other ideas. They basically have they'll have 10 courses and they just want to tease you to the next one. They're not actually going to just give you the real stuff. They're going to say, okay, this was just a start, but you won't believe what the next level is. And then you pay for that one and then that one. So uh, don't, don't go down that rabbit hole. Just, it, it should be quite clear. All right, Aaron, how often do you rebalance each of your strategies? I, su I suspect it's unlikely that they all rise and fall in value at the same pace. So very true, this is today's email, just to give you an example. So we've got our three tactical strategies. I won't use the options today, but they won't rise and fall at the same rate. Like you said, one of them is in the queues right now and the queues can rise and fall quite quickly. That one will probably outpace the Dow Jones in a good market environment. This one is in cash. So of course this one's not even moving. 
So what do we do when we've got three strategies in the same portfolio and they're all moving at basically different speeds? So one thing that you can do, I always reference my own work if it's very relevant. So if you go to the YouTube channel and you type portfolio rebalancing, what you will find is I have a three-part YouTube series here, just tailor-made just for you, my friend. First video, why would you rebalance? And this is essentially what you said. Sometimes you'll reach a point where one of your strategies is overtaking the intended allocations. For me personally, I stick to five strategies right now with 20% in each of them. You will get times when that deviates. The next video is how to. So this doesn't apply to me, but I will just state it for everybody else. If you've got some type of buy and hold portfolio, there's two ways they typically do it. The calendar way, where you will just choose maybe every six months you're gonna rebalance. You'll just take a little from the things that are doing well and you'll put it towards the things that aren't. Or maybe every year, that's a calendar method, or the threshold method. So if you did want five with 20% each, if it deviated, say, more than your chosen amount, 5%, if one of them goes over 25% allocation, that is a signal to rebalance the portfolio. That's the threshold method. But what I do, it's actually different than both of those. I just call it constant portfolio rebalancing because we don't rebalance anything at all, ever. We don't make any active rebalancing decisions. It happens automatically all the time. So what I mean is, right now, this strategy is in the QLD. I will not touch it. it I, when I entered the trade, it was exactly 20% of my net liquidation value. When I entered this one, it was exactly 20%. If this one changes position, I will just sell it. So I'll sell the Qs. I will buy the XLU in exactly 20% of my net liquidation value, which is very easy to do. It takes 10 seconds to calculate that. You just take your net liquidation value times 20%. That's how much you allocate to whatever ETF is next. That means that no matter what happened yesterday, this is now rebalanced back to 20%. And they all do this every time. Like this one's in cash. If this one moves to SSO, I'm buying 20% of SSO, exactly 20%. I will hold it for as long as I need to. Typically it won't be for very long. And then when I make a change, it gets rebalanced again. So my strategies actually, they're not overly active. Two to three, sometimes four trades per month, basically is what we're talking about. So it doesn't actually take that long to rebalance these. They do switch positions, you can see. This one moved, this one's actually been for about a month. This one maybe just over a week, this one a week. This one, uh, we've been in cash for a while and this one we took a trade yesterday. So the rebalancing happens very easily and naturally. We don't actually have to do anything. You just have to make sure that every new trade we take, we are actually buying our intended 20% for that strategy. Constant portfolio rebalancing. It's very easy to do. All right, Arthur. Arthur's very interested in uh, the digital nomad lifestyle. So <laughs> I've, I've had some emails conversations too. I, I, think, I think he's almost there. We'll, we'll see how close he gets. But the question is, comment on Dubai's healthcare system and other health systems, Panama, Taiwan, compared to Canada's free healthcare. Yes, good old free Canada healthcare. I'm Canadian as well. And yes, healthcare is free. But the problem is that it's not the best care. There's a massive bureaucracy, first of all. And then, of course, if, you, if something really does go wrong, very serious stuff, not only will you wait several months to even get to see a specialist, but we don't always retain our best specialists because we don't pay them enough. So, you know, you, typically if something's really wrong and you've got the money, you probably still do want to go to the U.S. and pay for your health care or go to some other country, you know, Dubai, maybe Taiwan, Cuba, all these places. There are places people can go. So Canada is free and that's awesome. And it, it's in general pretty good. But I have just in my personal experience, Taiwan system is exceptionally good. I would say it's similar in that you're not going to get world class doctors. They don't pay them enough. So a lot of even Taiwanese doctors, if they get really, really good, they might get three or four times the money to go to China or maybe to go to the US. And they will take that, of course, for the money. But the care is very good. It's, it's dirt cheap, super fast. Uh, you, you can get stuff done in the same day. I, I've told this story before, but maybe about 17-ish years ago. Yeah, I'm 47. So 17 years ago, um, my wife and I, we just saw this advertisement for this whole body 
sort of, you rotate through seven stations. You just, it takes a whole afternoon. It's a total body health check. So you do your heart, your lungs, your blood work. And then at the end, they make you drink this fluid and you take a PET exam. And the whole thing cost, I think, like three, $4,000, something like that. And uh, I just did it for fun. It just sounded cool. It turned out I had cancer. So I actually went through, they pretty much might've saved my life because at that age, that's a pretty risk, high risk cancer. But they screened it really quickly. I basically had everything taken care of. The next day, my treatment started. So I started doing surgeries. I had a couple surgeries. I had the radiation treatments. It was all done. Like I was done in probably three months, all the treatments. But the second day I had my surgery done. If that was in Canada, it probably would have taken five, six months to see specialists. And who knows what can happen? I mean, it's not always gonna hurt you, but there are those times when six months, you might not have six months. I mean, for, especially for young men at that age to get, to get, you know, that form of Hodgkin's lymphoma is not anything to be toyed with. Right. And so I'm very grateful that I was actually in Taiwan at the time. And I thought they were joking. I thought, cause I'm Canadian. Right. And I just moved there. So when they said, wow, this is serious, we need to take care of this right now. I thought, okay, uh, maybe I should go back to Canada. And they booked me for an MRI the same day, didn't have to pay anything, which blew my mind because of course Canada, you have to pay, I think at the time it was 700, I don't even know what it is now. Um, yeah, and they booked me for surgery the next day. So it was really, really cool. And I thought the surgeon was good. They weren't uh, maybe world-class, but everything got done. So that was good. Uh, Dubai is, I have no experience. I haven't been to the hospital, but my wife's sister came here. Um, last year ish, eight months ago, something like that. And their son was actually bouncing around on the bed, just jumping on the bed, fell off, hit his head, split his head open. It was actually a really serious, really deep cut. And they of course had to take him to the hospital. So they rush him to the hospital. This is in Dubai and they're tourists. They have no Dubai healthcare of any kind. They go there, they're taken right in, very little paperwork and everything gets done within a few hours. There was very little waiting, there's very little bureaucracy, almost nothing. And he, the husband, he's a plastic surgeon. So he obviously knows what he's looking for when he's entering a hospital. He said it was fantastic. His experience was phenomenal. They let him sit in there and watch the surgery being done to make sure that it's gonna, you know, it passes the plastic surgeon test, not just stitch it up, but make sure that it's not gonna leave a scar. He said it was fantastic. So I take his word for it. And there was no issue with insurance. They weren't charged, you know, a massive amount of money walking out the door. Insurance was recognized. Everything was great. So they said it was a fantastic system and I trust them and I've done research and it's supposed to be very good. So yes, I would say that Canada's free. The U S is fine. I guess I don't know much about it. It's a lot of people complain it's expensive, all that stuff. Healthcare is different everywhere you go, but I can say that there are places to go as a digital nomad where you can get fantastic care. Who knows? Maybe Taiwan saved my life. I, I really don't know. Maybe seeing that advertisement saved my life because I honestly did it just for fun and it turned out to be uh, quite life-changing. So I had several surgeries around my neck and one in my back and uh, yeah, we're good to go. I have had no symptoms since then. So yeah, cool stuff. All right. What are some of your indicators to open up a VXX UVXY broken wing butterfly? Good question. So a butterfly for people who don't know, let's do one on VXX because UVXY is being just stubborn without reverse splitting here. So the option strings on UVXY these days, it's pretty sparse. I mean, you have to go to the 450, the four, it's pretty ridiculous. So let's do the VXX. It's not a whole lot better because it's down pretty low too, but let's say you're doing one for two weeks out. And let's say we were going to do the 11 strike. So you buy a butterfly and I'll show you why I'm doing this in a second, but you're talking about metrics. This is a standard butterfly that would just be on the VXX. So you're talking about break even points here and then today's price right there. So right now, and you could even do a broken wing, like if you wanted to do 950, just for the sake of this example, let's do a broken wing where one of them separated a little bit more. So essentially it transfers some of the risk that was over here and it puts it all over here. So for this trade, you can see the price is right there and this is the VXX. So in two weeks from now, you want it to go down. 
So this is why I always say that even though there really isn't any high side risk here, like if the price skyrockets on me, I'll only lose $29 per contract. There's really not a whole lot of danger on VIX spikes, but it is still a short volatility strategy because you can see, I do want it to go down, you know, 5% or so would be great. So if we looked on a chart, what I'm essentially looking at is, yeah, like two weeks from now, where is it the 22nd ish? I would like this, let me move that over there. I would like this to be around 11 to get my full profit. And I don't think it's terribly unreasonable to expect the VXX to be here two weeks from now. That's kind of the pattern. It generally goes down, interrupted a little bit, goes down. But it's extremely likely to go all the way to nine. That would be an insane drop. It would be all the way below this chart. It'd be pretty weird if it went that far. It's not impossible, but it could. So the question is, what are the good metrics for a butterfly on the VXX? Well, the truth is it's the same metrics for any short volatility strategy. You would, of course, you would want to look at your VIX futures, your good old VIX futures. What have a lot of people, they get bogged down with is the contango level. Right now, 5% contango. They might think, well, that's positive. I should short volatility. You got to remember, though, that contango itself means absolutely nothing for these products. It's completely irrelevant. They don't trade based on contango. There is no, a lot of people think that, oh, it's, it's selling this one and it's buying this one, selling, buying, selling, buying. And of course, that's what's causing the price to decay. That has nothing to do with it. It's completely irrelevant. Contango is one of those things that people say that maybe sounds cool. It's really not impactful on the price. What you're really looking for is the combination of these two futures, which we call the VX30. So that would be the VX30 constant maturity indicator right here. You're looking at that in relation to the VIX index, and you want that to be positive. So what you're really looking at is something as an initial one would be the VX30 to VIX roll yield. So if that is looking good and that's high, then that would be a good sign. Right now it's about 35, 35th percentile. So 65% of all values going back in history, back to 2004, have been better than right now. So it's kind of on the edge. You could justify a short volatility trade right now, but it's kind of close. It's right on that cusp where you'd be shorting vol 65% of the time. That's quite aggressive. Sometimes I like to keep it down closer to 60. So right now might not actually be the green light to buy or to short volatility, but you could look at other things as well. You could look at, you know, the cash VIX term structure, for example. That's an exceptional metric if you know what you're looking at, where the shorter dated ones should be lower than the longer dated ones. In a perfect world, of course, you would want traders to have to pay more for a three month contract than a one month. That's a normal standard market. The problem is right now, the nine day volatility is elevated compared to the 30 day VIX. And it's actually almost the same as the three month VIX. So you're talking about a situation where for whatever reason right now, traders are pricing in some short term fear, some short term uncertainty. So those are the signals. Essentially, there's no difference between shorting vol with butterflies rather than shorting vol with the ETF, with selling other options, with buying stock replacement, with long put options. You're essentially trying to time the decay of the product, not the trade structure itself. This is something that people get sidetracked on a lot. They think that the option structure is the strategy. Like you'll say, well, what's your trading strategy? Oh, I open iron condors. An iron condor is not a strategy. It is just a trade structure. The strategy is when to do it. It's how to manage the risk. It's what allocation. It's how it works in with the rest of your portfolio. That's the strategy. The trade structure is just a shape of four options being bought and sold. A butterfly is just several options being bought and sold. It's not a strategy at all. So to short volatility on the VXX, you'd be looking at the same classic signals. You'd be looking at high roll yield, for example, high VX30 to VIX roll yield. You'd be looking at cash VIX term structure where each further out date is higher than the previous one. You'd look at implied volatility being higher than realized volatility, maybe significantly higher, maybe five to 6% higher at least. Things like this, that's what you're looking for. Standard indicators for short vol. And last question before we get to the open Q&A, I feel like I did a little better today. 
How do you have confidence with such a short history of the VIX products when it comes to trusting the signals they produce? Another good question. You guys are hitting the good questions. Last couple of weeks, I like this submitted question format that we've been doing. Um, this is a complete side note, but there's way more people watching than likes. So if you would be so kind, if you are watching this right now, and I know you are because I can see the little eyeballs on my screen, it tells me how many eyeballs are watching me. Um, go ahead and hit the like button for me. It, it really does help the algorithm. So how do I trust the short history? And you're absolutely right. It is a short history. But the thing is, the way I look at it is it's almost an advantage. We talked about this last week in the stream where the VIX futures launched in March 26, 2004. So we've really only got robust volatility data going back to 2004. And we've got a lot of other things that only really started in 2006, 2007. So you're talking about maximum 20 years, but really maybe 15 to 20 years of good data. And then before that, the VIX index launched in 93. We can back test it to 86. So that stretches it a bit, but the VIX index itself is not a good indicator for anything. So that's not overly helpful. And then you've got the implied volatility, historical volatility, all the standard S&P stuff that you could stretch back to the 90s and the 80s. But again, I look at it as an advantage because what I'm looking for with my strategies is a consistent, robust data set with bull markets and bear markets included, as many as possible. And when you look at the way that the world works these days, anything before the mid 2000s probably isn't useful anyway. Even if we had very robust data going back to the 60s and 70s, for some reason we had volatility metrics going back to the 70s, I wouldn't use it anyway because the Fed is different these days. The, their course that they're on is different. The government is different. The way they spend money, the way they bail things out, the way they save the consumer, all of these things are different. They're, it's a totally different macro environment. Interest rates are different. Inflation's different. Housing market is totally different in the last 20 years. So you wouldn't want to use that old data even if it was available. I think the robust set we have from about mid-2000s, say 2006, 2006, up until 2023 is a very good chunk of 20 years. I think that that's, that's the one that I would want to use. Even if I had 50 years, I would still only use that 20 years. That is essentially what I'm looking at. And fortunately, we've had several bull markets, bear markets, massive volatility events. We've had from 2016, March 1st, 2016, all the way to January, 2018. It's probably the lowest volatility period in history. And then we've also had some of the highest volatility in history. Of course, the COVID crash was the highest the VIX has been since October 1987. So we've had a really good mix of everything going here. And that's, that's my data set, 2004 to 2023. And every year, I'm just going to keep adding to it. The only reason I would really change is, again, if the world fundamentally changed, then you would want to fundamentally change your data set. If for some reason, we fiat currency collapsed and we went to Bitcoin as the global reserve currency and we abolished the Fed and it, was, it wasn't there anymore and the government was bankrupt so they can't bail anything out. If we were in that situation, then what good would volatility data from 2010 be? It would be a totally different world and that wouldn't be useful for anybody. So fortunately, that's not the world we live in right now. Come back 10 years and ask me this same question, the world might change. But as it stands right now, we have a very solid data set. So I don't look at it, like you mentioned, as um, very limited. I actually look at it as that's just what I would choose anyway, even if it was an extended period. I don't care. I don't want it. Uh, the world is different these days, and we have to trade based on what is right in front of us, not the market we want, the market we have, not the Fed we want, the Fed we have, not the government. We just take them for what they are and it's, it's bad and we all criticize it, but it is what it is. So, all right. Um, hmm. My wife just texted me. I did see it beeping. Am I on the wrong live stream? I mentioned I'm streaming this to two different places. I'm streaming this to two different places, and um, now that she mentions it, 
I bet you I'm logged in to my other clips channel. So I'm probably, I'm speaking to everybody. I think everybody's watching, but there's no questions being answered because the clips channel only has like 700 subscribers or something. So the number of people over there that are actually able to ask me a question right now is going to be quite limited. Um, so fortunately today for the three people that asked a question, I'm going to be able to, uh, to go ahead and do this. I can probably rip through these in 10 minutes. So sorry about that. I, I think at the last minute, I think I did log into the clips channel instead. My bad but I'm quite sure it's being streamed to the main channel. So I believe everybody's still gonna see it. You're just gonna be disappointed when you don't get your questions answered. Apologies for that. I think I'll answer four or five, and then I will try to log into the YouTube channel and see what's going on over there. So let's get this done. All right, how are you adjusting to zero DTE trading? Are 30 day vol measures still as useful? Well, if you, I mean, specifically for the VIX, I never used it anyway, so I don't care, but you are right that if, if enough of the market action shifts to the zero days to expiration, it's going to reduce the robustness of all the longer dated metrics, of course. That could be why, like I mentioned, it's probably not, but if you've been following my emails and you're part of the community, you've probably noticed that the front month, the VIX 9D, which is a nine day calculation, same as the VIX at 30 days, it's just calculated on nine days. This one's been bouncing around like crazy in the last year, that's why. There's a lot of action in everything short dated right now. So sometimes the difference between the VIX 9D and the VIX is really high like it is right now. It's, it's two points higher than the VIX, but then if, a single piece of good news comes in, this could collapse down and it could fix itself right away. It's probably been a little bit more jumpy in the last year, that's for sure. So how do I adjust? Well, fortunately for us, in many cases, because we're trading volatility ETPs, they are using constant maturity, constant rolling metrics. So part of the problem is solved based on that. Another thing is a lot of what we do is option trading that's going to be, have less effect. But bottom line is, yeah, you, you do have to shift everything down a little, right? Because there's just a massive number of very short dated options going through. If you ever did use the VIX before, which like I said, it's only useful in combination with other things anyway, those ratios tend to hold true, even if the absolute number isn't. But if you have been using the VIX in the past, you might want to stop using it or weight it a little bit lighter because it's not reflecting as well as it used to. It's just, that's not the part of the market that people are playing in right now. I suspect the zero DTE stuff will resolve itself soon. I think regulatory wise, I would not be surprised at all if, if those loopholes were somehow closed. So I, I actually did a video on this a couple weeks ago talking about a potential black swan event. If that happens, Remember, it did happen the day before Volpocalypse as well. That was one of the contributing factors to February 5th. February 2nd, the Fed changed regulations surrounding all these capital ratios, which caused a huge problem. And of course, the following Monday, everybody goes into the office that day and they have to do a whole bunch of rebalancing and a whole bunch of hedging. That kind of set everything in motion anyway. So I would not be overly surprised if something like that happened again. Not the actual... VIX spiking 115%, but the part where regu regulations suddenly change and people have to adapt quite quickly, maybe in one trading day. I don't know. It, we might see some fireworks. Who knows? Okay. Please comment on T-bills, short, tax advantages, no state tax. I don't trade them. Like I, if, if you're just talking about rolling short-term T-bills, I don't do that. Um, you could now, I mean, rates are at a point where it, it might be advantageous, but you'd want to keep your money available. So how short term could you actually go? I don't know about taxes. I, well, I do kind of, but I never say anything because we've got members from almost 70 countries. I don't give tax advice or talk about taxes too much, but that's good to know. No state tax, if that's true. Being marginable in your account up to 96%, keeping your idle cash busy while still being able to have other stuff on. Well, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Um, is that true? That doesn't sound true. 
if what um, the way that you worded that, it sounds like what you're saying is you could hold the T bills and still and on a ninety six percent margin. I don't know. That sounds too good to be true. But depends on what kind of trading you're doing. If you if you need your capital available, then that's obviously you have to check whether it is actually available or whether you're seeing some of the numbers wrong. That sounds a little bit odd there, but I always have to keep my capital because I don't know what'll happen tomorrow. I'm a tactical investor. We don't active day trade, trade two to four times per month per strategy on average, but I do need access to my money at all times because maybe we come back Monday and I have to actually get into a trade. Right now I've got two strategies in cash, but maybe they both have to allocate on Monday. I don't know. So I don't tend to look for these opportunities to do anything with my idle cash. I consider cash to be an active portfolio position. It's just, it's there because that's the best spot for my money at that time. It's gotta be ready to allocate at any moment. Okay, you said we do 45 to 60 days to expiration iron condor, uh, 45 to 70. But the current IC is only 35 days to go, but premium is about the same as if we opened it. So it's like opening a new 30 day. True, if it gets within, I have no lower bound, but I've often thought of just making a hard rule. Uh, typically what happens with an iron condor is if you're using a 50% stop loss, right? Let's pull up the iron condor you're talking about. It's not quite the same premium, but it's close. Like you said, this hasn't moved a whole lot. And right now the 17th of March contract has 35 days. So you're right, has 35. I have no hard rule on when to get out. 45 to 75 is when we open them. I would never open a trade if it has less than 45. 70 or 65 is probably ideal, but there's no lower bound. But what we do have is a 50% stop loss, 50% stop gain. And that typically takes care of things. If you, if on an iron condor, it's very difficult to have a trade going well and to get it inside about 26, 28 days, somewhere in there. If, if this price stays here for another four or five days, the profit's gonna start building a lot faster. If it starts to deviate out, it's gonna start losing money a lot faster. This is what you're talking about, the gamma. We call this dancing, dancing on the gamma knife edge, where depending on where you're sliding here, your delta and your gamma is changing quite quickly. So the stop losses take care of the days to expiration. But like I said, I have often bounced around the idea back and forth in my head whether I should just say, look, if it's held on for 30 or less, Day 30, no matter what happens, you just close it. Because there, there is some gamma risk building there. If you go under 30 days, then you can wake up one day, market's down 3%, and you can actually take a loss on that. So it wouldn't be a bad idea. I think 35 is a little ambitious. I think probably like 30 or even 27 sounds fine to me. But you wouldn't, if this trade is open and it's only got 20 days to go, that would be very difficult to imagine. It's probably because it's right on the profit edge and up or down in any single day and it's gonna either stop gain or stop loss. So typically it's handled by itself. But I'll give it some more thought. That's a good comment. Um, you're not wrong. Under, I don't know, under about 27 sounds to me like it's time to exit and just take that capital, just chalk it up to a trade that didn't go perfectly as planned and move it to the next trade. I could see that. That's also, like I said, no need for a hard rule, but I don't think that's a hard rule that would be damaging either. So I might think about doing that just to make things easier. People like rules, like rule sets, and that's not a bad rule. Just 27 days or less, the trade is done, no matter where it is. I like that. Okay. Someone says I've done well on YouTube. No, I'm so disappointed with my YouTube success. I really do feel like my videos are content wise. I, I don't know if everybody feels this about the videos they make. I wouldn't make them if I didn't like them. Like I'm not, as you've noticed, almost 0% of my videos are marketing. Like there's almost no marketing anywhere on any of my YouTube videos. I've, got, I've done over 200 of them. And maybe for five or 10 seconds in the video, I'll mention that there's a, 
there's a free trial on the website. Nothing I do publicly, my videos or my articles, almost 0% of it is marketing. I'm doing these videos because I think these are valuable lessons to teach people. And I really do think the content is good. But then it's a little bit depressing sometimes when I look at the view counts and the subscriber counts of some of these other like trading option type people that are 22 years old and have 200,000 subscribers or something. That's what I'm talking about. That person, I've watched some of their content. I'm like, there's just nothing actionable here, but they're very good at the business of getting attention. It's not about the investing. It's not about the option trading. It's not about the content of the videos. It's about the thumbnails leading to the titles, enticing people and them holding stacks of cash. And I made $4,600 in one day. Look at me. And I just don't do that stuff. So yeah, I'm never going to really catch on. I'm, I'm not good at getting attention. I'm not controversial in any way. Nobody really dislikes me. Like I don't have any haters. That's probably a problem of mine, to be honest. I should have more haters. I should be saying more controversial things. I should ramp it up and try to piss people off and say things that are just, can you believe what that guy said? And then people hate watch me. I have nobody that hate watches me because I'm just providing what I feel is really good content. Um, it's maybe boring. I don't know. So no, I've not done well on YouTube, but at the very least, I am proud of my videos. I think that I stand by every one of them and I'm very proud of the fact that I have never done any outlandish marketing of any kind. I don't pull on anyone's emotional strings. I've never held up a stack of cash in a YouTube thumbnail. I've never said, you won't believe how much money this strategy will make you. I've never done a single thing like that. Um, but, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'll experiment with one, one crazy thumbnail. And when you see it, you'll know, you'll be like, oh, I know what he's doing there. He's, he's experimenting. He's trying to be a millennial or even now it's a Gen Z, right? They're so good at YouTube. They're, they're just exceptionally good at social media and an old dinosaur like me. I mean, how can I compete with that? But to tie it back to the original question earlier on, if you are looking for somebody's course, I have nothing against them personally. Like as people, I'm sure they're fine. I'm sure they're intelligent. I'm sure all of that is true. But if you think that there is trading wisdom to be gained by somebody who's 22 years old, who has a YouTube channel with clickbait thumbnails, I got bad news for you. There is nothing there for you. Even if they were good at it, it's still going to take them 10 years to iron out the mistakes. It just does. Nobody can... Investing is really, really difficult, and it takes a very long time, longer than 10 years, to have made enough mistakes that your portfolio is somewhat bulletproof. Otherwise, you are just benefiting from a, an advantageous market environment. You applied a strategy, or you thought you knew something here, and look at that, it worked out, right? If you haven't done it for 10 or 15 years, it's nothing against the person. I'm not insulting them or their intelligence. You just haven't been doing it long enough to know what can go wrong and how to fix it and where, how to manage that risk. It's not something that you can just guesswork your way through. You have to live through it to know that. So yeah, it's a, it's a blanket statement to say this, but I should have added it to the list. Like number five, what did I say? There's four red flags. I could add a number five red flag. If the person's under 30 years old, I'm sorry. They might be a super nice person. They might even be really smart and well on their way to a super successful career, but not yet. They're not ready to get your money just yet. If they're 30 years old, I'm sorry. It's just not good enough. You have not seen what the markets can do. And there's no substitute for live trading. You just, yeah, that's it. So... I wouldn't want to say that though, because that's dangerously close to just blanket statement and people are going to get upset. No, no, this one guy, he's, he's the exception. Yeah, he might be 23, but he's awesome. I'm sure he is. I'm not insulting anyone. I'm just saying no 23 year old on the planet has traded through enough different market environments to be a successful investor. They just haven't. That's my opinion. So 
clickbait titles. Yeah, I should start churning out some clickbaits. What ETFs are the best to apply iron condors? And could you share, share some metrics about iron condor strategy, win percentage, win loss ratio? Uh, okay, so yeah, I'll answer this in two parts. First of all, what ETFs? I typically stick, we, we have the course, we have the iron condor course. And in the course, where was it? Probably right here. In the course, I haven't gotten to the final three lessons. So I think lesson 1.22 or something like that, 1.23 is going to be where I start talking about expanding it to be a complete portfolio of iron condors. Right now you can see we've got two open and they're both on the SPY. So far we've only traded the SPY and the Qs within the VTS community because I just introduced this strategy with this course fairly recently. I've been trading them the whole time, but fairly recently. So what I might do fairly soon, when I feel like most of the community has gotten through the Iron Condor course, and I can put those final couple videos, at that point, I'm going to do the diversified portfolio, where at that point, we would be moving beyond just the SPY, the Qs, the Dow, and we would actually move into things like the TLT, for example, 20-year treasury ETF. You could even do the IEF uh, gold, the GLD, you can do that. You could do the sector ETFs. So if you like the utilities ETF, as long as there's enough liquidity and there typically should be unless they're a really small, you know, issuer, but those sector ETFs, they can also be good. So if you want to trade energy, if you want to trade, you know, commodities or whatnot, you can do all kinds of things, but I will probably introduce the full portfolio. So that would be my answer. You want to stick to the major asset classes and then you want to find the ETF or the index with the highest liquidity in that. And you could build yourself a diversified portfolio of nothing but iron condors. That's the intention eventually. That's what I've been doing for you know, 10, 12 years now. I don't just trade the SPY. I don't just trade the Qs. I trade all kinds of stuff. But it's just a matter of introducing it to a community of people and not bombarding them with trades because you'd be surprised how it's, it's a real fine line between giving a small percentage of the community, a lot of active trades and having 90% of people just say, this is getting too much for me. I don't want this anymore. I, I follow you because your portfolio is fairly easy to follow. And I have to make sure that the active traders, while there is only a few of them, I have to give them what they want too, which is kind of the VTS options Academy that's coming. That's going to be much more active trading for the, that select rare people that actually want just more and more and more trades. Most people don't want that. I think the way that we do it now with typically on average about 15 trades per month, give or take, I think that's pretty much the sweet spot. But yeah, that's what you would want to do. As far as your second question, I was going to say I don't get into um, win rate. This is something that everybody asks for, when you're talking about options trading, there's so many people that ask for win rate. It seems to be the one thing that people, they seem to gravitate toward this win rate thing. The thing you have to understand about win rate, I'm just pulling up a spreadsheet here. Um, you can have a 95% win rate and lose money. There's nothing saying you couldn't do that. If you just sell the way out of the money wings, you could easily on average have 19 wins in a row and one loss. But what do we know if you sell five Delta calls or puts on the S&P 500 and one of those calls goes in the money? Well, you lost all of those 19 wins. That's what happens when you sell the wings. So what people typically do to boost up their numbers, right, their win rate, is they take trades with a very high probability of success. A lot of people do something like selling super out of the money put options on individual stocks. So Tesla, let's say, for the sake of argument, let's say if it was trading at 700, you'd sell the 400 Tesla put, right? It's so far out of the money, it's probably going to win. And they just do that month in and month out over and over again. And it seems like they're a great trader until the wings actually pay off. Because as I've always said, the only reason that there is premium to sell that far out of the money is because statistically speaking, it is possible that it gets there. 
If it's not possible that the price goes that far, that option wouldn't be worth selling. It would be zero. It would not even be five cents. The reason that you can get what people think is, oh, I can sell Amazon put options and there's juicy premium 30% out of the money. I can just churn those. Well, the reason there's juicy premium is because there are times when it goes there and you lose all of your profit that you made. So win rate means quite literally nothing. Let me add that to the list. <laughs> we, we should start building a list here of all the red flags. So we have these four. The fifth one is apologies to everybody who's young. I'm sure you're well on your way to a super successful career, but if you're under the age of 30, you just don't have enough experience yet to get my money. Uh, maybe in the future you will, but right now you don't. And number six, of course, is people that pump up their win rate. It means nothing. It's just a fundamental misunderstanding of how markets work. Win rate, it, it doesn't matter. What you're looking for is rate of return. That's all that matters is actual performance. You can't eat your win rate. You just, okay, you have an 80% win rate. It doesn't tell me anything about the magnitude of the losses on those 20% of trades, right? So don't look at win rate. As far as rate of return and all that stuff, um, the only thing that I really show with my iron condors is the long-term performance. So this is basically what it looks like. Move that since uh, the VTS service started. So Iron Condors have been in the portfolio basically since day one. It launched in January 2012. And the only time that this strategy was out of the portfolio was right about here, from March 2018 until maybe September 2018. So maybe this stretch right there, it was not in the portfolio. Other than that, it's always been in there. And then there's another point right here that it wasn't in there. So maybe these periods there, but otherwise it's been in there the whole time. And it's like, this is good. It's been, I could argue that it's been a pretty decent period. Certainly last year, my strategy made 26%, the iron condors um, in 2022. That was a pretty good year for iron condors, to be honest, because what you're looking for is choppy markets. You don't want strong trending markets. That's going to hit either of them. If it's trending down and crashing like financial crisis style, then you're going to get stopped out on the low side. If it's 2017 style, everything's just going straight up. You're just going to get stopped out as you go up. What you want is choppy markets with mid to high volatility, which is 2022. So this is why I always say you need to have some type of option strategies in your portfolio. Because last year I had three strategies that did not do well at all, of course, because they're based on largely based on equities and two times equities. But you need to have strategies that can plug those holes. So this one was up double digits and this one of course was up really well. That's what you want. It's not gonna work all the time. If, it's a, if 2023 is an amazing year for the stock market, then it might actually flip. I might have my tactical strategies, they might just crush it. And then iron condors are chopping around and not really making anything. That happens too, but you definitely want a diversified portfolio. So I would always encourage people to do that. And didn't we just talk about 10 minutes ago how I don't do any marketing and I, I should start doing more marketing? Well, here you go. So if you wanna learn more about iron condors, at the very top of the chat, there is a link for the free trial. You definitely want to take the free trial and you want to take the Iron Condor course. It is roughly, as of now, I think it's 18 parts, but there's more coming. Let's see how many I've done so far. I've been pacing myself. So there's 18 so far and I'm thinking there's going to be 25. So I should be able to finish this off in about a month. I'll get back into doing more of them. And uh, yeah, you should take this course for sure because it's free and it comes with the VTS subscription and iron condors are awesome. And if you know how to trade iron condors, you are pretty much halfway to your options trading journey. And then at that point, you probably throw in a volatility strategy, throw in a VIX option strategy, and you're good to go. A couple of tactical rotation that takes care of equities and you know stocks, bonds, gold, all that stuff. That's more efficient to just trade with the ETFs themselves. And then option trading is more for delta neutral stuff. So bad years like 2022, you can have option strategies that um, you know do well. My three main option strategies, it's no real surprise that last year they did well. We had iron condors did well. VIX options kind of always does well. 
And um, VTS options also did well. Uh, no problems at all in 2022 as far as option trading goes. And this, this one here, this excludes my VIX, but it includes things like earnings trades, which also did very well for me last year. Uh, what do you want in earnings trades? Well, you want markets that are actually moving, right? And so I actually had a couple of earnings events last year where you get into the trade. As I've explained before, I have a video on the Clips channel talking about how I do long straddles. I don't do short straddles, I do long. So you want movement. And I got a couple of movers last year. Of course, it was a rough year, so that was fantastic. Uh, you wanna learn these things, for sure. Tasty seems cool. Seems cool to earn 5% when trading is slow. Is there any more context to this? Do you mean tasty? What is it called? Tasty trade? Yeah, not tasty works. Tasty trade? If, are they saying 5% is good? I'd be impressed if they said that. That's low. I, you don't often hear people talk about 5% being good. But anybody who thinks 15% isn't good is not a real investor. 15 is very good. So I'd be very impressed if somebody out there was saying five is okay. That's good. It's, it's not, it's, that is a little bit low, but, um, anybody who's brave enough to, to not go the extreme other direction and just be one of those stupid people who say, Oh, 50%, that's such a terrible return. Like, I, I can't believe you don't make a hundred. Are you telling me you don't double your money every year? What a, what a loser you are. Um, Meanwhile, every serious investor in the world understands that 15% a year is, is world-class. So, um, I wish you would start option trading soon. I know, I do too. It's, this is one of, I don't know if it's a mistake per se, but this is, I just wildly misjudged my time management. It's, this is taking, so much more time than I thought it would. I really did think I could get it done in three or four months and it has not materialized because I, I'm so busy with my normal stuff to try to find that many hours to do other stuff. Like each video takes about 10 hours and there's probably gonna be about you know 60 to 80 videos. So that's, that's a lot of hours to find free time. I already work 70 hours a week in my normal thing and then I have to find an additional, you know, hundreds of hours, it's, it's been tough. So now you have haters under 30. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of haters after today's live stream. Everybody under 30 is going to be all in my comment section. Um, but that's fine. That's good. Nothing wrong with haters. I often say this, that engagement is engagement. On social media, that's another thing too, is people often think that the way to succeed on social media is just to have a whole bunch of people that like you. Well, turns out that's not true. If you can actually have an equal number of people who like you and hate you, that's when you can really accelerate your social media growth. If you're somebody like me who really is just non-controversial, um, no haters, never say anything outlandish, it's not triggering the YouTube algorithm. It's not getting any Twitter engagement. It's just, oh, this, this guy said something vanilla. Okay, great. I'm not going to send that to everybody. But if you, that's why the most popular people, they say things that you just think, well, how can this person be that stupid, right? There's no way they're that dumb. I think they're intentional. I think they're laughing when they tweet some of these things. They're saying, oh, this is going to get the algorithm going for sure. I'm going to, you won't believe what I'm going to tweet. They don't even believe it themselves. How could they? If they're smart people, and they're successful and they have life experience, they wouldn't be tweeting those things, right? They're, they're not that dumb, but I think they're doing it intentionally because that's what triggers the algorithm. Haters, you really want a healthy base of haters if you wanna be popular. And I have none, so. Yep, it is what it is. Performance is based on real fill, always. Yes, my performance that I've been reporting is real fill prices, including trade fees. Have you ever used UUP? Yes, but not options. I've used UUP in the portfolio from time to time as a safety position. Problem is it doesn't really move very much. It's very safe, it is safe, but sometimes cash is just better because it, 
even in a good stretch, it really doesn't do that well. So I've dabbled with UUP. It's, it's okay. When you're looking for safety positions that are uncorrelated to the stock market, it's actually hard to find. That's one of them that's pretty decent. But then even in a good year, it'll only make, you know, five, 10%. It's probably not even worth it cash. And then on options, I can just see, would I trade anything on UUP right now? I don't know. It's a good question. I wouldn't use this personally because like I said, you want to stick to the major asset classes. When you're building a portfolio of iron condors, I don't see anything wrong with just doing stocks, bonds, gold, heavily weighted to stocks. So maybe half your trades would be this stock market, either SPY or the Qs, the NASDAQ, and then maybe 40% in bonds, gold. So one trade each in bonds, gold, and then maybe one additional trade on something you thought had a good chance of just chopping around sideways. So maybe if you happen to see that, yeah, UUP, kind of a strong trend. It has bounced a little bit. We talked about this earlier that you don't want to ever walk into the trends because it can reverse strongly, but I would be fine with this. If you wanted to open an iron condor today on it, for example, what is the um, IV rank of that thing? It's low. So uh, you could open a calendar on UUP right now. You could look at a Mm, I don't like to use the weeklies, but let's see the, no, the volume's terrible there. So you, ah, there's not really a good one, is there? I do 45 to 75 and there isn't one. So I was going to say you could buy a long calendar. If you wanted, you could tighten your stop and you could do something like this. Let's just check this thing out real quick. Remember I said like trade ideas are stupid. It's just a person has to put real capital or it's not worth saying. And here I am giving an idea, but something like this, like a long calendar. I don't like the fact that it's only 35 days though. So scrap that whole thing. But yeah, UUP volume, it looked actually pretty decent. If you're, as long as you're using the monthlies, look fine to me. I just, it's not really in my main rotation. I do stick to stocks, bonds, gold, real estate, utilities. And then outside of that, maybe like occasionally the energy ETF, the financials, stuff like that commodities occasionally, but they move violently. So for iron condors, it, it's not great. UUP probably wouldn't make my top 10. I have to troll bigger channels to grow. I think one thing that I might try to do, and it, it, it would also benefit other people as well, but I think later in the year when the option course is launched and everybody's going with that and we're doing good with that community, I think I might actually start reaching out and doing, um, interviews, podcasts with other people that you guys might know. Um, I know some of these people. I just, I've never spoken to anyone. I've never gone on theirs. I've never invited them on mine, but I could start to do, like I have a segment planned kind of, I've got all these segments for my live streams planned. And one of them is, which one would it be? Let me move that. It should just pop out at me, shouldn't it? Hot off the press, in the maze. Uh, maybe it's the hot seat. I can't remember. Yeah, maybe I called it the hot seat. Just this is not the official names or anything. It's just an idea for, it wouldn't be every week, but occasionally, you know, once a month or something to actually do stuff with other people. That might help a bit. Do I trade S&P futures? Not really. It's mostly just a function of having a community though. I don't really care how I represent the trades. It's all kind of the same to me. You're doing SPY options, SPX options, S&P futures. It's kind of all the same. And so for me to have a community, to make things easy for everybody, most people have basic options approval and then they have basic stocks approval. But to go into futures, it confuses people. They, we've got a large community in 67 countries. I have to be a little bit careful to to not complicate things because my brain can get complex pretty quickly. And I've ran into that problem in the past where I just, I just basically made everything so complex that people couldn't follow it anymore. And so sometimes easier is better. Nothing wrong with futures. In fact, they probably do have tax advantages. And if you have a really large account, then sometimes trading the futures will scale better. But for our community, typically just do spy. Right now we have two spy trades, both of them, um, literally the spy. And then if somebody had a huge account, 
then they could do the SPX instead because the SPX is 10 times notional and you could scale down your trade, the number of contracts pretty easily there. All right. Okay, <laughs> it's funny. Okay, if desired, I'll hate you. Well, it's not good enough to tell me you hate me. You have to come back every live stream and spam my comment section hateful comments. And then I have to take the bait and argue back and forth with you. And then the YouTube algorithm will know, oh, this he said something interesting. We should show this to a bunch of other people. And then we'll really get the ball rolling here. So there's several problems with that. When haters, we've had a couple over the years. I've done a, like everything I do is completely public, like public performance, public live streams. I'll sit here and answer live questions. I have no idea if someone's gonna come in and call me a fraud or whatever, I don't care. But the way that I respond to haters is typically because I feel bad for them. I really feel bad. Could you imagine somebody hate watching content? It's just the, the whole concept, maybe it's because I'm old, I don't understand it. But if you don't like something, how in the world is it possible that you're here? Why? That doesn't even make any sense. I'm busy. I don't have time to hate watch anybody. Just wouldn't even occur to me. So when I see somebody make a negative comment, I always think, well, that's interesting. What's going on in that person's life that they actually think, A, that I care. I mean, I'm pretty successful. Everything people say is probably just gonna bounce off me anyway. But even if it bothered me, you're still wasting your time. Why do you want to bother me? It's just the whole concept of hater and doesn't make sense. But then I need the haters to become popular. So it's kind of a, it's a problem. Maybe I should manufacture some, some beef with some people. I don't know. It's just, it's not in my nature. I would probably just say, I'm sorry you feel that way. That's too bad. You probably shouldn't waste any time in your life watching me. If you hate me that much, you should probably just leave and maximize your own time and, you know, work on your own career and your own business. It just wouldn't, I wouldn't get angry if somebody called me a fraud or a liar or a cheater. It just wouldn't bother me a bit. I just would give some good solid life advice. You know, you, you're doing okay. You'll, you'll get through this. Don't worry. That's how I would handle it. It just, it just doesn't make sense. All right, do you ever look at historical volatility versus implied volatility? Yes, we do, quite often. Um, where can I direct you? I feel like I wanna direct you somewhere because I feel like I recently did something. Clips channel? Oh, it's not released yet. Yes, I have a video coming out next Monday on the volatility risk premium. But yes, we do, of course. Uh, the volatility risk premium, what you're talking about, is basically the implied volatility minus the historical. So that's the simple here. But I also have one that I built myself called the Traders VRP. And of course, for the VTS community, everything they see in blue, these are all articles and videos that they can click. But one of them is the Traders VRP. And what it is, simple VRP is just implied. So 30 day VIX minus 20 day historical. This is a fine metric for just a general VRP because the VIX of course is a calendar metric, but there's only 21 trading days in a month. So this is essentially a really good metric for just basic stuff, but mine is more complicated. So I actually show in this article how to calculate it. There's formula here, here, and here. And this is just my interpretation of a better metric for trading volatility. And then at the bottom of this article somewhere, I said that, you know, VRP positive, this might be a risk on, VRP negative might be risk off. And then I showed this little back test where you can actually use just this signal and nothing else. This isn't even optimized. This is just greater or equal to zero. There are obviously much better ways to do this and other metrics you could add to it and make this infinitely better, but it already beats the S&P 500 just on its own in just a very, an arbitrary zero, greater or less than zero number. It already improves the results by about 15% and reduces the drawdown substantially. So long story short, yes, it is one of our metrics. I wouldn't say it's the best metric we have, but it's, it's represented within my strategies. The theory generally goes that if implied volatility is higher than historical volatility, that should be representing a somewhat stable, normal market. And then when you have those flip, doesn't happen often, but when it flips, 
that's probably meaning that there's risk, right? Because what does that mean? Historical volatility is what actually happened in the past and implied is what people expect to happen in the future. So obviously in a stable, calm market, people are expecting future volatility to be higher than we've seen. That's just a natural state of things. Traders have to be paid for the unknown risk going into the future. But if you ever get a period where the realized volatility in the market is actually substantially high, it's actually higher than in traders are interpreting in the future, it probably means you're right in the middle of something. It might not be an epic collapse, but it's probably something serious. You, you would want to pay attention. So that's the theory. And yes, you're right. It's, it's definitely something to pay attention to. I track it every single day, and we've got metrics that cover that for sure. You could, you could do well in just just focusing in on that. Of course, we do you know, 20 other things as well. But like I said, just on its own, VRP could probably beat S&P buy and hold. You could do many, many ways where you could improve the results substantially. Is the Iron Condor course going to be in the Options Academy? And which price range do you think the Options Academy would be? So the Iron Condors, I'll throw it in there as well. It'll be done, right? It's part of the VTS Academy. So it's part of the subscription. And yeah, no reason why I can't just toss it into the Academy as well. But the options that is upcoming and not finished yet, so crazy number of questions about this options course. But basically what I'm planning is essentially we are planning... Um, We're planning to, I'm planning to launch it with just, I, can you see this? These are folders, so I might have it turned on so you can't actually see this. I'm going to take a shot in the dark and say that everybody watching this can actually see this page right now. But the Academy, what I'm planning on, so the intro, of course, is just going to be a bunch of intro videos. The Iron Condors will be included. Those are all videos. Essentially, people are going to be include, interested in the Vol Step strategy, which is a pure volatility strategy, right? It is just the short, long volatility strategy somewhere around here. I've got some performance numbers like that, for example. I would probably trade the safer version, which is going to be this instead. This was a strategy that I would just give people and I'm going to tell them exactly how to build this. And then of course, there's going to be the actual signals every day that go out to them. That's one strategy that I would focus. And then the other would be my VIX options. And this one is a fairly complex strategy. It's not so easy to do, but this is my top performing strategy. So this is the one that everybody's kind of focused on. They, they really want to figure out how I managed to do this, right? Over, over that time period, how am I getting 24% when I just said it's, you know, 15% a year is awesome. How am I doing this? Well, truth be told, it's not so simple, but I am going to do my best to basically give it to people. So after a couple of, a month or two, I expect that everybody will be able to do this themselves. I will cover everything that I can think of. I will make a video for every little thing I can think of, and that'll be it. And then in the future, I would be planning all my other strategies. Eventually they would be released. Maybe every three months I'll just, you know, add the earnings trades. And then three months later, the wheel of fun and five months later, the calendar roll. So that's essentially my rough outline. This is why it's taking so long. You can see that these, these are all, you know, they're, they're all kind of done. Like I've, I've got scripts and plans and all this stuff, but this stuff is not easy. It takes a long time to put videos together. I think people would be surprised how time consuming it is to do good work. What you'll mostly see if you buy courses out there, what you'll mostly see are people who basically turn on a camera and they will have a rough outline, but it's basically just a series of live streams. Essentially, they will just talk about their strategy. But that's what all the courses are. Every course that I've ever investigated and, and checked out, that's what it is. You'll see a bunch of videos in there. It'll look like, wow, there's so much content here. But then you go into them and you realize, oh, it's, it really is just a series of somebody talking on a live stream. Well, I've done hundreds of hours of, of that. I don't want that. I want them to be all polished videos with the 
the, each video have one specific topic that we cover from you know five different angles and then we move to the next video, the next topic, the next topic. I don't, the live streams are gonna be part of it. I'm gonna probably do a live stream every week for the VTS Options Academy, but that's just this, right? You can ask me anything you want. As long as I know that I'm speaking to people who are in the community, right now I can't speak, I can't tell you how I built that volatility strategy. That's not part of this community. Sorry to be, you know, financial incentive there, but people work as well. But as long as I know people are in the community, we'll do tons of live streams. That's not the hard part. That's the easy part. The hard part is making, you know, a, a good foundation of 60 really polished videos where people can go back for years to come and it's quality stuff. You'd be surprised how long it actually takes. Mm. I am, I'm grinding it out, believe me. I'm here in Dubai. I have not, I'm a member at Emirates Golf Club. It's, I could probably hit a three iron to my golf course. It's right over there. I can see it from my balcony. I haven't been once, not once. I've been to the gym, not as much as I should have. I, I run a lot, but I've, I've not done anything. I've just work all day. Moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep, I'm working. I haven't, I haven't even gone to the golf course. I haven't even hit on the driving range yet. Been here for over a month. I haven't literally not gone outside for more than a, a sandwich. It's, it's really crazy. And I'm not done yet. So hopefully people are going to be patient. It's, it's an insane amount of work. Videos are hard. Polished isn't necessary. I am an extreme perfectionist. It is necessary for me. I understand that most people would say that, and that's why I'm planning to mix both formal polished videos with casual live streams. And it'll be much more trading related than this. What we will probably do, the reason I have this account, this isn't my full trading account, this is just our practice account for the live streams, but I have it here. We can take any number of trades you want, and you know, as long as I'm talking to people in the community, we can do VIX options trades every single month if you want. We can just, I can, I can just do these live for everybody to see just over and over again. In fact, I can even show people. Again, I'm not positive that you can see this because sometimes on these live stream things, I click the button that says hide my desktop. So I'm assuming you might not be able to see this. But for example, like these are all trade examples. All of these videos are exactly how I did the trade start to finish, all executed live. Every one of these are trade examples. So, and these are all, you can't really see it, but you can see the trade kind of developing over time and see how it gets different over time. These are, these videos take place over multiple weeks. This isn't just one trade. This is a very unique strategy that gets built out over a long period of time. So depending on how the market reacts, I've basically just done live trades over and over and over again. And there's gonna be tons of examples of this, plus all the theory up here. So yeah, it's not so easy. It's gonna take a while. But I promise you that if, if you stick to the course, you will get the actual strategies. This isn't trade ideas. This is, you will be able to just, if you wanted, just say goodbye to me forever and just be a trader yourself. You could do that, but you are a member for life. So you'll probably stick around and jump on the live streams and do our live trades together with the whole community. But if you wanted, you could just take the course and okay, he gave me his volatility strategy. Now I can just trade it on my own. Yeah, you could do that. Totally, you could do that. I wanna make sure that people get what they're paying for for sure. All right, I'm leaving. Thanks for the suggestion. What was my suggestion? To become a hater and start yelling at me? I hope that was you. I remember, like I have so few haters, I remember the hater I had. I had a hater about two years ago. He came into my live section and because I always say, this is how basic some of these haters actually are, but I always call this my practice account, right? I, this is just our practice account. We just do practice trades. 
right? I could open a trade right now if you wanted. This is just a practice account, like exactly what it is. So I had a hater <laughs> basically for weeks came back and saying that this is paper trading, that this is just a paper account and I'm not a real trader. For some reason, he thought that because I used the word, this is our live stream practice account, that for some reason that means that I'm paper trading. And I quite literally had to make a video for him showing him, I went into my trading platform and showed him all the live trades in a video. And unfortunately for him, I actually got some new subscribers based on that video. So it was, the hater helped me. But it's funny, you say one wrong thing and people think they just, they smell blood and they go for it. I don't know what it is about people hate watching. It's just, it's a, it's maybe a cultural thing with the younger generation. I don't think there's too many 50 year olds who watch live streams and they're in the comment section, you know, saying mean comments. It, it wouldn't occur to me to do that. It just, I'm just way too busy and have way better things to do. There are people out there that I dislike. They, should I? say a name? Is that even controversial? Like who, who could I say that I really don't like? Oh, there's that one guy, Grant Cardone. I think he's just a clown. Sorry if you're a fan of his. I think he's just, he's an absolute grifter. I have never spent even, I've seen him on Twitter. Like I see his comments and that's it. I hate the guy. It wouldn't even occur to me. I don't even know what he does business-wise if he has live streams or videos. I wouldn't click on anything that he's ever done because I've already decided that, you know what, he's not for me. I've seen some of his tweets. They seem pretty stupid. He probably does it intentionally. He's probably much smarter than his tweets show. And I don't like the guy and I'm not gonna spend one minute of my life hating on somebody I don't like. It just wouldn't make any sense to me. So I don't know why there's haters in the world. What are they doing? I, I don't know. Oh yeah. Super Dangerous Mouse, that was his name. Wow, you remember. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I guess saying that this is our practice account, I guess he, he thought he got me. That was the zinger that he needed. Um, even if it was a zinger, I, I actually encourage people to paper trade sometimes. I don't myself, but when I first started, I remember using my paper account. Yeah, I used to give myself I think it resets to like 100,000 or something like that. And I used to use it for some testing. Nothing wrong with using paper accounts. All right, I think I got all the questions. And I think I've stayed too long. It's an hour and a half. I do this every time. I think it's supposed to be an hour live stream and I always go an hour and a half or three hours. Main channel here too. <clears throat> As you travel, what other countries think of the US? Has other countries' view of the U.S. been improving or declining over the years? I couldn't speak on behalf of other people. I could only tell you what I think. I used to live in the U.S. I lived there for eight years. I've lived in, I don't even know how many cities. I've lived in a lot. Um, Seattle, New York, Phoenix, San Francisco, Houston, Louis, um, I guess Louisiana was only like two weeks. That doesn't really count. Lived in Florida for a couple of months, Jacksonville. I lived in San Jose for a year. I guess that counts. Lived in Oakland for eight months. That counts. So I've lived in maybe eight cities for a year or longer, each of them. I've lived in the US, I've seen the United States. I've lived there, I've experienced it. Basically, I considered myself American. Um, that started in 99 and it ended in 2007. So since 2007, I have not been back to the US. I was actually banned from the US for 10 years. So that's why I didn't go back. I, had a little issue at the border and um, I was actually kicked out of the United States for 10 years and I lived there. I quite literally had my stuff in my home in Scottsdale and was not allowed to go home to get my stuff. It was crazy. Um, I guess when I say that, how many people are on the live stream? I suppose I can't just drop that and say, okay guys, <laughs> that's it, we'll see you tomorrow. Probably wondering how does this guy get banned from the US for 10 years? If you wanna know, I'll tell you. So back then, my wife at the time was doing her MBA at Rice University. 
and she had some type of, I think it's called an H-1B visa, something like that, like a bunch of letter visa. And I was just a, at the time, I was just a Canadian going across the border. We can go across the border at will, basically. You just show them your passport and boom, there you go. You just go across the border. So I would just do that. I would just go to the US and I basically lived there for a long period of time. I was trading back and forth. But for some reason, she saw this guidance counselor at Rice University who told her that it would be easier for me to travel if we were married, right? If, if I used my, her, my sub visa under her H-1 visa because we were two weeks away from getting married. So we were gonna get married in Taiwan. And for some reason, Rice University didn't actually ask her, are you married? There was some type of miscommunication where they thought that she was married, but she wasn't married. It was like two weeks to go. And so they gave her the visa to use for me in my name. And so when we went to get married, we were on our way to leave to get married. We go to Taiwan, I get my visa, and we go to Taiwan. And then we come back to Taiwan, but we are not officially married because we have to do that in Canada. We just did a ceremony there. So when I came back, we showed both of these pieces of paper at the border. And of course, we are not officially married yet. So the border guard said, congratulations on getting married. And at s somehow it casually came out that, you know, we're not actually getting married till next Tuesday or something like that. So the border guard freaked out. Of course, he, he could have just said, oh, just put this piece of paper away, show me your passport. Next week, you can use that piece of paper and you're gonna be just fine. Just remember, that's actually for married people. It's not for soon to be married next week people. That he didn't, he decided to use his power and get me. They took me into the back room, they yelled at me, they called me, you know, uh, whatever, like I'm trying to come into the country illegally and they treated, they treated me really badly. And I know how to speak to them. I was being perfectly courteous and polite. But anyway, they said, no, you lied to a border guard. That is punishable. 10 years, you're out of the country. So I told them, well, this is a problem because I live in Scottsdale right now. So how am I supposed to go get my stuff if I'm not allowed in the U.S.? They kicked me out of the country. They sent me back to Canada. So I had to get on a flight and I had to go back to Canada. This story gets even funnier. So in Canada... I needed to go back to Scottsdale, but I can't enter the country. So I hired a lawyer to fight this case for me. I spent maybe $10,000 on a lawyer. We did all these court things. We signed all the papers and we back and forth. And then I got my thing. And it turns out I lost the case, right? I technically did break the law and there was really nothing to do. So I wasted $10,000 on a lawyer. But then after the court case lets up, the lawyer tells me, you know what? I actually have a friend who works at the border at just near Montana, right? The Alberta, Montana border. I have a friend who works there. If you just drive across the border, I'll make sure that my friend is there. And I was like, are you sure? Like this sound, this is illegal, right? And he's like, yeah, it's illegal, but you know, you are Canadian and this is kind of a situation. So it's fine. I'll make sure my friend's there. So I listened to him because I have to go to the US and get my stuff. So I go to the US, I'm crossing the border. For some reason, it was just horrible luck that day that that guy's superior officer was at the office that day. So he was basically looking over the shoulder of the guy that was supposed to wave me through. And for some reason, they caught me, and that was it. And so I actually got in a lot more trouble. Oh, no. No, that's wrong. This happened years ago. Sorry. I got down to Scott. Oh, this got even worse. So I, it wasn't going this way. It was going this way where they caught me. So I went down to Scottsdale, I got my stuff, I put it in my car, I have an SUV at the time, I went to the bank, it was the Bank of America, so it was a US bank, I withdrew all my money, which was I think $33,000 in a bank draft, right, because I didn't want to send it, because that would be proof that I was standing there, so I took a bank draft out of the Bank of America and I drove across the border, and the border guard that was supposed to let me through didn't actually let me through. He got caught by his superior and they caught me. So they took me out into the back. They, they found everything. They stacked it all up on this table. They stacked my computer, my, you know, my golf range finder, my golf clubs, all, everything that was valuable in any way, shape or form. They put it on this table and they basically said, everything you can show me a receipt of, you can keep. Anything you don't have a receipt, you have to pay duty, 40% duty or whatever it is on these items. 
Plus, because of the bank draft, they found that too, because that's over $10,000 of value, they are legally allowed to confiscate that. So they took that because of course they're border guards and didn't, didn't matter how polite I was, I was definitely breaking the law at that point. So um, yes, they took everything. I basically said, well, everything there is four years old. I basically don't even want it anyway. So obviously I don't have receipts. There you go. Lost all my stuff, paid a lawyer $10,000, lost my bank draft. I mean, it was punishing. And then basically they said, okay, well, we're not gonna arrest you. This is understandable what you're doing here, but don't come back for 10 years. So I was literally banned for 10 years and I haven't been back since. So that's my story about the US. I am a criminal, a hardened criminal. Um, but really, I mean, the whole situation, I, every time I think about this, it makes me so mad because that border guard quite literally could have just said, not today, just take this paper. He, he was, my passport was on the desk. He could have just dragged the passport over and said, you're a Canadian, you're allowed to be here. Show me that paper next week. Have a good day. The whole thing could have been resolved by just catching one nice guy on a day, but instead, it cost me like $50,000 and 10 years ban in the United States because of one border guard. So even to this day, everybody who talks about how, you know, police are stupid and you know, the tax guy will never find you. And sometimes people ask me why I tell everybody to make sure you're paying your taxes. If you're a digital nomad, make sure you're doing everything on the up and up. You know, my, my wife, I always tell her, sometimes she has that impression because in Taiwan, they don't really respect the, the law very much there. They don't respect the government, the police. They're kind of just, you know, they can argue back and forth and whatnot. I'm always the type like, you know, to smile, say, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. All that super polite, make sure. Yeah. It's because of my experiences with this, that even the polite Canadian who did everything right, even that guy uh, had it out to get me. So lesson for all you people out there. A lot of it is luck. You know, you could just you could just get the wrong officer on the wrong day, but certainly don't go through life thinking that people don't have any power over you. They don't they they can't stop you like I know my rights. I can do this. It's like these people I see you know on these police videos when they get arrested. I'm just thinking, what are you doing? If there's an officer on the scene, this is a serious thing. It's yes, sir, yes, ma'am, hands in view all the time. Don't ever shove someone. Don't ever argue on the scene. The, the time to argue is in the police station in a chair with your lawyer next to you. On the scene of the crime? Are you crazy? I, it just it drives me nuts that there's so little respect because they really do have power over you and they can ruin your day and possibly your life if you do something wrong. So, yeah. Don't mess with people in positions of power. You don't know if they're having a horrendously bad day and they're just going to be, they're gonna rake you over the coals just because, or they're gonna misinterpret something you said as adversarial when it wasn't. They're gonna think you were aggressive when you weren't. They're gonna think you were reaching for something when you really just wanted to show them something. You have no idea. It just, I, I just see all these people, they don't take it seriously. I did everything right and I still got caught. So I know there's some people out there that had it much worse than me. So let that be a lesson to you. Even a smiling polite Canadian can, can still have things go wrong. Just cross on the Southern border. <laughs> no problem. Just loop around. Just how do I get from here to there? I could go to Mexico. Yeah. I could have tried a third time. I thought, you know, I pushed my luck. I was the second time I was, illegally breaking into the US for sure, no doubt. Um, the first time I think they were crazy, they should have just let me go. The second time, that's a little much. You know, just driving across the border and arranging with a lawyer that there's gonna be a guy waiting to wave me through, that's, that's not cool. But I had to do it. I had everything in that, that house and all my money in the bank. All right, last question. This looks like an investing question. So now you know you're talking to a criminal here. So yeah, maybe that's controversial enough to get some viewers. Question on VIX futures cumulative order flow numbers. That's not something I look at. Some days like today, we are seeing huge numbers. Any significance to be drawn from these 
types of trading. Well, the one thing is we know that short-term trading has ramped up a lot. So there's really nothing can be learned. You don't know if these are positions with any conviction behind them or whether they're going to be exiting in an hour. You have no idea. The second thing is no matter when you're looking at order flow, unless you're in the room with that person, you can never interpret what their exposure is. If you see a massive block of trades go through, say a crazy amount of VIX calls, 50 cent trader is back and he's buying VIX calls. A lot of people just assume that means, oh, somebody knows something. Somebody knows the market's gonna crash and they're buying VIX calls. You don't know whether that's somebody buying a block of VIX calls that can really move the market, or maybe they're just hedging a massively long portfolio and they're feeling too exposed. And what they actually want to happen is the market to go down. There's no possible way by looking at order flows and blocks of trades, you can't piece it all together. Unless you're in the room, that could be one part of a five part trade that has a completely opposite exposure to what you think it did. So I wouldn't interpret any of those things. I don't look at that. I just assume, oh, that's just liquidity for the rest of us. It's not instructive on what to do whatsoever. This caught my eye. Happened to me similar when crossing the border with my family from Windsor, Ontario to Detroit. Yeah, I, I, I think that would be a problem too. Like, let's say there are a lot of people because that border is super close, right? There are places in Canada where people live here and work there and they kind of need to cross that border. That would be rough, right? If you happen to catch the wrong person on the wrong day, that could just, that could derail your life. I really could. I mean, mine, I didn't need to be in the US. I wanted to be, but once they kicked me out, I went to Taiwan basically, so... Joke's on them. I actually like Taiwan more. I went on that whole rant. I didn't actually answer the question. What do people think of Americans? Well, what I would hope they think is that Americans themselves are wonderful people. But I don't think it's difficult to see that the U.S. in general is, along with many other Western countries is going in a certain direction that things are probably going to get worse before they get better. So there's nothing wrong with Americans. Like I would never say anything critical about American, Americans who live there, the individual people. But the government, the decisions being made, the condition of the cities and the, you know, favoritism towards certain groups and not taking care of certain other things, the... Handling the pandemic, you can't really criticize because the whole world screwed that up. Um, I don't know. I like Americans. I have no negative thoughts about Americans. America, if I was president, I'd do a few things different, but that's not up to me. Hopefully people enjoy their country and all good. I don't particularly like living there. Doesn't really match with my values, I don't think, anymore, but... I say the same thing about Canada. I just, Canada used to be nicer 20 years ago. It's kind of moving in the wrong direction. So hopefully they right the ship and everything gets better from here on out. Same with the US. Hopefully you get some type of decent administration for eight years and some actual positive changes happen. I don't know. Next you're gonna ask me who I would vote for. I'm probably building up a decent number of haters today, to be honest. I've said a few things that might, might trend somewhere, right? Should I tell you my opinions on all your political leaders? Should I turn my investing stream into a political rant on mm, insert said politician? That might be interesting. Is there anything else here? Trying to get them all, because I know I'm streaming to the wrong place, I think. So people didn't really get their full questions. All right, that looks like it. So we got all those done. Remember, next Monday, I'll just show you where it's going to be. Next Monday, you're going to want to go to my YouTube channel. Click on the Community tab. Am I on the Clips channel? No. Why isn't Community tab showing anything? Nothing. Nothing. Go to the community tab and I will have a post there. Oh, does that mean my internet died? 
hopefully you're all still here. Um, yeah, you can submit your questions. And the submitted questions will probably get slightly better answers than the live stream, because in the live chat, I have no idea what people are going to ask. I might go off on a rant about America and, you know, me being a hardened criminal who tried to sneak into the country and got caught and all that stuff. So submit your questions, you'll get better answers. And sometimes I turn them into clips for the other channel. So thanks everybody. It is midnight for me, so I am going to sleep. <laughs>